This is Beekeeper Confidential. I'm your host, Mandy Shaw. Bee season is here. I've begun the first inspections of the year and have found that four out of the five colonies that I've inspected so far are queen right and overwintered with plenty of honey stores and their populations are looking good. I made a short video about the one colony that is having queen issues and you can find that on my Beekeeper Confidential YouTube channel. As for the rest of my hives, I've begun making splits and have put up bait hives around town. I am ready for swarm season. When I first got into bees, it was with mason bees. Today's guest is a master gardener and a mason beekeeper who supplies mason bees and advice to the community right here in the Portland metro area. Meet the mason bee maven, Debbie Thomas. You're a master gardener. I am. I'm a master gardener. And a Mason Bee guru. Yes. <laughs> yes. I am known as the Mason Bee Maven. The Mason Bee <laughs> Maven. I love that. I know. So it. how did you get into Mason beekeeping? Um, it was when I became a master gardener. We had to study them along with many other things that you study when you're a master gardener. And I took an interest in them. And I took a class that the Master Gardeners offer that really zeroed in on mason bees, and a girlfriend and I walked out of the class halfway through it. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Why? Um, did you just have to go get mason bees right then and there? Because I found out I was doing things the wrong way. Oh, wow. And so I came back to it about a year later and wanted to do it the right way. Yeah. So what is the right way with mason bees? We know we see a lot of mason bee or native bee houses available at places like Costco now that right. come with the tubes. I mean, are those really mm -hmm. the right thing for our mason bees? I, uh, uh, this is my opinion. I do not like the Costco mason bee houses. Everybody's buying them this year. They're very cute, and it's a good start. I'll say that. Yeah. It gets people in the door. What I don't like about the mason bee houses Costco has is that there's not a big enough overhang on them to protect the bees. We have a very wet climate. You know that. Mm -hmm. um, the bees need protection. And if you hang that in a tree, it, it's going to get wet. Oh, it's going to be yeah. exposed to the elements. And so also with those houses, they have bamboo reeds in them. Uh, the problem with bamboo is that the diameter of it is way too big mm. for mason bees. Oh. And mason bees are going to spend all of their time trying to plug that great big hole with mud. So instead of the female laying eggs in all those tubes, she's going to be spending all of her time trying to plug it with mud. Oh, that's sad. I know. And their time is so limited. I know. So they're only around for about two months. So that's why I don't like those <laughs> houses. <laughs> and what about the ability to harvest the cocoons? Are you a harvester or do you like to leave them in the tubes? No, I clean my bees. And uh, that class that I mentioned was a bee cleaning class. Oh, okay. And I had no idea what a bee cleaning class was or what that meant. I envisioned being in a classroom, sitting in a chair, watching bees flying in the air, and how in the heck are we going <laughs> to catch them to clean them? I had no idea. <laughs> With little, like, s toothbrushes or something. I no. had no idea. <laughs> and my girlfriend brought a block of 
her, her bee house. <gasps> it was one of the a piece of wood that you just drill holes in. Yeah. And once she found out she, she couldn't partake in this class, she couldn't remove her bees. Mm-hmm. That's when we walked out of the class. <laughs> so, um, yes, I am a person who, who cleans my bees. Mm-hmm. I, I harvest them every year. You don't have to do that in nature. Does anybody clean the bees? No. And they survive. Uh, however, you're going to have a healthier population if you clean them. And the reason you clean them <laughs> is because every single time the mason bee goes to a flower to get pollen, she gets pollen mites on her. Okay, let's talk about pollen mites. Okay. So pollen mites, uh, again, when the female goes to a flower to get pollen and then brings it back to the nesting tube so she can put pollen in there for her baby, the egg she's going to lay for next year's crop, she is putting mites into the nesting tube along with her egg. Every time she goes in and out, she's depositing mites in there. And so once she fills up her nesting tube, there are a bunch of mites in there that are going to eat all the food that's intended for the babies. And do they also reproduce in there? The mites? Yeah. Sure. They've got all this food. They've got a great environment. They're having a party. Yeah. <laughs> it's their little karaoke <laughs> den. Gosh, the first year that I did mason bees, when I went to harvest them, yeah. I remember opening the tube and it looked like sawdust. It looks like a kind of a <laughs> yellow f- fluff. Yeah, and then I looked closely and I saw it was moving. It moved. It was <laughs> like really gross. But yeah, I just remember being horrified that there was this pile of crawling. I know it's gross. Mush. I know. <laughs> uh, I have I have to take my ten time magnifier to look to see the mites. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are teeny teeny tiny. They are. A swarm type mob that will move. Yeah. Um, and so when a mason bee hatches out and they have these pollen mites in the cell, maybe in front of them, and yeah. they're having to walk through that, do they carry it out and leave it on flowers? Well, the mites will continue to be in the tubes. Mm-hmm. Yes. So they're it's, there. It, it's mites. See, what happens is if you don't clean your bees, or if you have a wood block where you have drilled holes just in a block that you can't clean, uh, it's recommended that after two years you throw that away wow. because it completely becomes infested with mites. If you were a bee wanting to have babies, do you want to go into a house to lay your eggs somewhere full of mites? No, you don't want to do that. But yes, the whole thing will be taken over by mites, and so the bees will stop coming. Oh. Which is what recently happened to one of my houses that I made. The very first house I ever made, I had to throw away a couple of years ago because I looked at it and I went, oh my God, what is that stuff moving on the entire front of my bee house? And I got my magnifier out and the whole thing had mites on it, so I threw it away. Yeah. Yeah. So when people tell me that their mason bee houses aren't working anymore, the bees aren't coming, that's when I start asking them, Mm -hmm. what type of home are you providing? How long have you had it? Is cleaning the mason bee cocoons the only way to prevent these pollen mites from taking over? It is. It really is. If you don't clean your bees, again, it's not the end of the world, but you're going to have a healthier population, more bees. You're, you're going to be doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if you just want to have a nice little mason bee house for your kids to look at for a couple of years, then, yeah. then you don't clean them. Yeah. Why mason bees? What is so special about them? They're so fun. To me, it's like uh, similar to having a, a butterfly house or a bat house or a bird house in your yard. You know, you put it up, you watch, you anticipate, you look at things, scoping it out. Are they going to make it a home? Are they not? Are they going to mate? Are they going to have babies? <laughs> and so for me, they're great entertainment. I love watching the whole process. I love watching them hatch. I love watching them go back and forth through the tubes. And 
they're just busy little bees. Yeah, they really are. I have a, a set of mason bee houses on my front porch right by a porch swing. Yeah. So I could sit on the porch swing and look up and see the pollen packets on their bellies as yeah. they're going in. Yeah. You could hear them if they go into the wrong tube and oh. disturb another bee. You'll hear them. <laughs> they don't like it. <laughs> yeah. You want to put it somewhere, the, the bee house, where you can watch it. Absolutely. And I always try to remind people that these bees are super chill. They're super gentle. Oh, yeah. They don't sting. They're like a fly. Mm -hmm. they, they, they look like a fly. They're very shiny and metallic, and they're gentle. I think when people hear that it's a bee, they just automatically assume that there's dangers and risks involved. But with mason bees, there's really not. I know. I really try to educate people uh, when I tell them that I have bees to let them know that these are these are a different kind of bee. These are mason bees. They're a friendly bee. They're a pollinator only. I you know I kind of liken it to a butterfly. Mm -hmm. So hopefully. <laughs> They'll try them. <gasps> yeah, I think yeah. of mason bees as a way for really anybody to keep bees if they have the right environment around where they set up the little house. Right. Um, it's such a fun and easy way to get involved in beekeeping without, uh, you know, the whole plethora of things that comes with honey beekeeping. Right. And they're they're just such good efficient pollinators. That's the what thing. What makes them such good pollinators? They are a solitary bee. So unlike a honeybee, um, they don't have a hive, and they don't have as many duties as a honeybee. They don't have to take care of the queen. They don't have to make honey. They don't have to make uh, honeycomb. They don't have to do all that. All they have to do is mate <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and then lay eggs, and that's it. Do the mason bee boys die after they mate? They do. And uh, here's the thing. When mason bees first start coming out in the spring, and, and by the way, they're, they're the first bees to come out. They only require 50, 55, 60 degree air temp. So they're real early bee, usually into March, April. But what happens is the males come out first. And the males are out for about five days, maybe more. And they're just kind of hanging out, waiting for the females. <laughs> they're having their little bachelor party, yes, waiting they, for the, yep, <laughs> the <they> ladies. <laughs> they're, batch, they're batching it. <laughs> so, so then the females come out, and they mate. And there's kind of a quiet period around the bee houses for a while because they're busy mating. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, the males die. So where do they mate? Because with honeybees, there's a, a drone congregation area, and there's really? this whole thing. All the the males go and they hang out in this area, and really? when the queen goes on her nuptial flight, she's escorted um, to that area, oh my God. and they they chase her down there. But with solitary bees it must be a little bit different you know i live in a very forested area i have a lot of oak trees and a lot of fir trees and i have watched them and for some reason they do this little dance thing up and down the trunk of my oak trees up and down up and down up and down uh, flying and uh, you know like a tw like up to 20 feet oh wow and uh, that has to be part of this mating thing. And uh, they always do it in a sunny area. But anyway, after they mate, the male dies. And then it's the female who does all the work, of course. <laughs> it's the female who <laughs> comes back and lays the eggs and, uh, and takes care of, you know, getting them in the tubes, putting cells in each tube that have the babies in them. So each mason bee tube in the house, they're, they're like, ideally six inches, uh, we'll have anywhere from five to 15 babies mm -hmm. in that too. Why such a variation in numbers? What do you mean? Well, I mean, I've noticed that when I'm harvesting, some oh. tubes have like five or six, the and cocoons. others have like way okay. more cocoons. Well, that takes us back to the mites. Remember the mites? Mm -hmm. Remember? So if she deposited a whole bunch of mites in that tube and brought all those in, those mites are eating the pollen that's intended for oh. intended for the babies. Th that's why you want to get rid of them. So when you're harvesting a cocoon and or a tube 
and there's a little dried up larva in there. Yeah, there's all kinds of things in there, which is why the uh, sooner that you can clean your bees, the better. What's the earliest that it's safe to, to harvest to your harvest. cocoons? Uh, the bees are pretty much done by June, mid-June. Mm -hmm. They're done. So June, July, August, September, October, November. October, November, you could harvest. There is a fully formed bee in there now in mm -hmm. a waterproof cocoon. I usually don't clean my bees until January just because I'm busy doing other <laughs> stuff, holidays and whatnot. But yeah, the earlier you clean them, the better to get those mites out of there. And then how do you like to store them while you, um, after you clean them? After I clean them, um, I, and by the way, cleaning them, what you do is after you open up the tube and get the cocoons out and all the good stuff and the bad stuff, you, you soak them in a very diluted bleach water for like three minutes. A cold water, not a warm water, because a warm water will wake them up and they'll start hatching. <laughs> and you also don't want to clean your bees in the house because, again, they'll start hatching. Mm -hmm. So I do all of this in my garage. It's really very easy. I just take a colander and do it and wash them off. I just, I store them in the garage. Mm -hmm. It's a nice, cool place. And then I have to remember to bring the cocoons out in probably mid to late February. Oh, okay. I haven't put mine out yet. Okay, well, it's time. They're hatching. Okay. I yeah. usually wait till spring break, and then I'll stagger them. Mm -hmm. I'll stagger, like, how many I put out at a time. Because mm -hmm. I'm always paranoid about the fall start to spring. Like, we'll have some really hot weather, and right. then it'll get cold and rainy for a long period of time. Right. But you could, you could put them out now. Okay. I'm going to do that today. Yeah, it's time. And remember, they're going to be around for two months. People are kind of freaked out and saying, well, you know, there's nothing blooming. But they're going to be around for two months. In mm -hmm. the next two months, there's going to be a lot of stuff blooming. I actually have a lot in my yard right now. I've got Daphne. I've got crocus. I've got uh, daffodils. I've got a pink dawn viburnum. I've got all kinds of stuff. And they're not just going to stay in my yard to pollinate. They're going to go to my neighbors, you mm -hmm. know. So how far is their flight range? I, I actually did some research on that today <laughs> in case that, that came up. Uh, because a girlfriend of mine, I, I gave her some bees last night, and she's concerned she doesn't have enough in her yard flowering to mm -hmm. accommodate the bees. Um, they will go 300 feet. I have a, a, a large yard, and I, I looked to see wha how long my yard is. It's, it's 100 feet. So my bees go to my neighbors, and they go to the people behind me. My neighbors have peach trees and plum trees oh, and cherry nice. trees. and Yeah. And that's their specialty, right? <laughs> yes. Flowering fruit trees. They are called an orchard mason bee because the orchardists like to use them because they're such efficient pollinators. In fact, it only takes 10 mason bees to pollinate an entire tree. What? Yes. So I'm going to tell oh you. Oh my gosh. I know. I'm going to tell you some fun facts. Here. Okay. So 10 mason bees to pollinate an entire tree. A female mason bee will visit 300,000 flowers in her lifetime wow. of eight weeks. Yeah, she's only around for about eight weeks. So 300,000 flowers. Mason bees are 10 times more efficient than a honeybee at pollinating. And, and way more low maintenance. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> honeybees are a lot of work. I got my start with mason bees because honeybee keeping is so much more labor and knowledge intensive. Not to mention, it's an incredibly expensive hobby to get into. But with mason bees, the startup costs are low and you really only need to tend to them a few times a year. I went to the Home Orchard Society yesterday and... While there, I, I looked through all their acreage and all their trees, um, just because I'm a master gardener and it, <laughs> and it interested <laughs> me. And I looked and I saw they have mason bee houses there to pollinate their orchard, mm -hmm. but they also have honeybees. Hmm. They have honeybees there too. So I think part of it is that, you know, yes, the mason bees pollinate the early blooming trees, mm -hmm. fruit trees. But I think there are some fruit trees that bloom later and that maybe the honeybees 
take yeah. over for some of that because they're around later in the year. There's been a lot of discussion about bringing so many honeybees into the area and them being non-native that they're creating too much competition for the native bees. What do you think about that? Well, mason bees are a native Oregon bee. Honeybees are not. They're European honeybee. I would love to really get into bees more. There's a whole study going on in the state on native bees. Mm. I think the more bees, the better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Somebody asked me the other day if uh, honeybees and mason bees fight. And no. I've never seen that. No, they don't fight. You know who, who does fight with the other bees is the wool carter bees. Oh. They are non-native. They're a European solitary bee that showed up. And they are territorial, and they will fight other bees oh. because they want certain plants to all to themselves. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I call them woolly bullies. <laughs> That's cute. They're, they're nesting material is the plant fibers and so they have these little spines down the sides of their abdomens and they use those to like scrape up plant fibers like lamb's ear fox gloves they really like and then they make these little woolly blankets to use in their nest how <laughs> interesting <laughs> yeah they're interesting but they're mean to the other bees which they will, is not they will, good they will dive bomb yeah other bees but uh, the mason bees and the honeybees get along just fine. Right. Getting started with mason bees. Here's what you need to know. Ideally, you need to provide a house for your mason bees. And the mason bee house should be located in a protected area, not just out in the open. Uh, mine, mine are all under the eaves of mm -hmm. my house. Um, and you also want to face them a certain direction. I guess we didn't talk about that either. Oh, yeah. Well, so for honeybees, the recommendation is always south-facing. Oh. But they can handle not being south-facing. But what's the best direction for mason bees? Uh, in a perfect world, the uh, mason bees would be facing east towards the sunrise so that the sun can, can warm them in the morning. They need heat. They need a little bit of heat to warm up yeah. uh, before they can fly. Are mine facing east? No. Mine are not <laughs> facing east. Mine are facing north. Oh. The reason mine are facing north is because that's where the eve of my house, that's where my overhang is, and that way I can sit on my deck and watch them because you want to watch your mason mm -hmm. bees. <laughs> You don't want to face them towards the blazing sunset that's west. Mm -hmm. So I would not recommend facing them west. I also, some of the literature says to face them south, but honestly, here in the Pacific Northwest, all of our weather comes from the south. All of the rain, the entire south side of my house takes a beating. Mm -hmm. The rain and the wind. That's a good point. My entire front door gets wet. That's all south facing. So I tell people, do not, do not put your houses south facing. In fact, a gal this week uh, emailed me and said, Debbie, I got a mason bee house from you last year and nothing happened. No bees came back. And oh, I started no. asking her. You know, where? when did you release your bees? Did you keep your bee, empty bee cocoons by your house? What direction is it facing? Da, da, da. I asked her all these questions, and when she said it's facing south, I said, that's it. That's your problem. So once you get a bee house, and once you have it located in a good location, then you can either get nesting tubes for your bees or uh, trays, which can be taken apart so you can clean your bees. Which do you like better? I prefer the tubes rather than the trays. Mm -hmm. I've tried the trays, and what I dislike about the tray is when I try to clean the tray out, there's these stacking trays that you take apart. They're wooden. You use something like a screwdriver to gouge <laughs> through the hole, the oh. groove that is in the tray. And what I found is when I'm taking the screwdriver and trying to get the bees out along with the mud plugs, I'm killing the bees. I'm killing the cocoons as yeah, I'm trying to get them out of rough. these. 
these grooves and it it broke my heart yeah. um and so i don't use the trays anymore i've kind of modified my well okay my most expensive bee house is one that i got at a local bird shop and paid 60 bucks for it and that's the one where i have to gouge out the bees <sighs> and so what i have done is i've put nesting tubes in the tray Mm -hmm. so that the bees can still use it and all I have to do is remove the tube tear it open and I can get to the cocoons no more gouging right so yeah. I modified it yeah so I am a fan of the two tube system and oh. by the two tube system <laughs> I have a six inch cardboard tube and within the cardboard tube I have a six inch paper tube is it any kind of paper, or is it a special kind of paper? These are Mason B tubes and liners. The inside mm -hmm. tube is called the liner. Again, because we're in a wet climate, Pacific Northwest, I do use a special kind that has a coating on the outside mm -hmm. just because of our wet environment. I take out the paper tube once the, the Mason B has mudded up. I call it mudded up. She, mm -hmm. she blocks off the front of the tube and the back of the tube with mud, and she's done. And she'll move on, and she'll do another tube. Uh, I every female Mason B will do up to three to four tubes. I didn't realize it was that many. Yes. So wow. the, more, the more tubes you have, the more bees you're going to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if somebody buys 20 Mason Bs, from me I kind of explained to them okay 10 of these are going to die because 10 are male mm -hmm. 10 are female so those 10 female are going to need more than 10 tubes to come back to lay the eggs because each female is going to do you know maybe three tubes so with the mason bee tubes when you take the liner out to clean it to clean your cocoons in the fall, um, there are some enemies of mason bees. Mm -hmm. Everybody has mm -hmm. enemies. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, <laughs> honeybees have enemies. There is a parasitic wasp called a chilcid wasp that will come around the mason bees in June. And even though I'm calling it a wasp, it is a teeny tiny little gnat about the size of a mosquito, all right? The reason I do the two tube system is because that stupid little mosquito <laughs> <laughs> can eat through paper. And that inner tube that I use is paper. The outer tube that I use, the cardboard one, the Chilson wasp cannot get through that. It cannot penetrate oh. the cardboard. So that's why I use the two tube system. Mm -hmm. Um, again, by using two tubes, when the inner tube, the liner, is full, I take the liner out and I put in an empty liner, and that's how I increase my population. I do that during the season when the bees are filling that's all these so tubes. That's so smart. Yeah. When you take the tube out, what kind of environment do you store it in? What I do, I and you have to be gentle with it. I mm -hmm. mean, there are forming larvae in here, either the eggs. I take mine, and I st store them in empty coffee cans. Um, I make sure that I store them in the same direction, mm -hmm. in horizontal. Yeah. Um, and I take a nylon stocking, mm -hmm. a knee-high. I take a knee-high nylon stocking and I put it over the opening on the coffee can while I'm storing it in the garage. And I do that so that those stupid chilsed wasps cannot <laughs> get in there. They can't get through the fine mesh of the nylon. What happens when these wasps get into the mason bee nest? They will, th they're parasitic. They will go in and um, they will take over the baby bee. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't, you don't want these. Yeah. You don't want these. So look out for those in June. 
yes. and pull the, <clears throat> the tubes as they're being mudded over. I pull my tubes mm-hmm. as they're being mudded over, okay. and there's bees coming and going, coming and going, mm-hmm. coming and going. And it's like, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, I want to get my little <laughs> tube out of here, excuse me, excuse me. And then I take it out, and then I, I just put a new empty one in. So you want to have a lot of empty liners, mm-hmm. those paper liners. You want to have a lot of those. Where can people find those? You can get them online. You can get them at local bee shops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Okay. The mason bees really expend a lot of energy making these nests and going on these visits to flowers and visits to the the mud hole. Right. Where are they getting their energy from? Um... I don't know. <laughs> I think maybe it's the nectar. Yeah. The I would nec- think that the nectar is probably sustaining them and giving them energy while they're working. And maybe the the pollen that they've eaten as a larva has built up in their bodies. Because I know with honeybees, if they're well nourished as a larva, they're right. going to have a nice fat reserve in their body as, right. as an adult bee. So it must be similar for mason bees. I do know that the mason bees do have fat reserves. I know they do. But I don't know how long they last. Yeah, Yeah. I don't know if they eat the pollen or if they eat the nectar. I don't know what it is that they eat. So another thing we didn't talk about was the mud. Yeah. Um, And the mud, the, the, so a mason bee is going to need to have some mud available, okay? And everybody's backyard has dirt, right? Right. You've got to. Okay. <laughs> so um, some people are concerned about not having mud. And uh, as I told you, I raise dahlias. And so a lot of my uh, empty garden bed has a leafy mulch over the top. So I don't have a whole lot of exposed dirt either so in years past I have taken a beautiful little tray of mud and put you know some water on the dirt and had it right there for the mason bees I put it right next to the mason bee houses (laughs) you know trying to help them out here you go and they didn't use it they like to go to this one little spot that I watched them go and they seem to like that I don't know if it's more clay soil or what but um, but they have their spots they like to go to to get mud so I don't really think that that's that big of a factor okay um how do they carry the mud back to the nest I'm not sure. I don't know if they carry it on their legs. I think they carry it in their mouth. Yeah, that makes sense that they would carry it in their mouth. Yeah, and I think they mix it with some of their saliva. You know, they want it to be the right consistency, but they do a lot of trips. They're so dedicated. A lot of trips. (laughs) There's there's two different kinds of mason bees in our area. There is the um, uh, horn-faced... Mason yes. bees, the little brown ones, okay? The, uh, and for me, in like Oswego, the majority, I'm going to say 80 to 90% of my bees are the, the horn-faced. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, the ones I really like are the ones that I don't have a lot of. And those, are, those are the blue orchard mason bees. Mm-hmm. They are, again, very metallic, very shiny, very... Uh, very pretty. <laughs> they look like a fly. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't have a lot of those. They're bigger also than the horn, horn-faced horn ones. So um, because I'm such a fanatic and I'm constantly looking at my houses, what I do is when I see a blue uh, orchard mason bee going to a tube, I will mark that tube. Oh. With a little red felt pen. And again, the bees are coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. And I'm over here trying to mark one of the tubes with a felt pen. And <laughs> and so then I can mark that one tube. And I know that there are blue babies in there. And I make sure that I those get some little extra love oh, for me yeah. because I want more of those. So I never I never give those away. I always keep those <laughs> for myself because <laughs> I'm a pig. <laughs> <laughs> well, that gives me the idea to try that with my own because I've seen both. 
Yeah. Um, but it do, it is mostly the horn faced ones. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, I like the blue guys. Yeah. I do. So if you have a mason bee house and your uh, your mason bees are coming out, and you're not quite ready because you haven't bought nesting tubes for this coming year, um, you can stop the process of the bees hatching by putting your bees in the refrigerator, which sounds really That's crazy. That's where mine are. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it sounds so nuts, putting your bees in the refrigerator. It's like, yes. what? What are you talking about? Somebody asked me if it was even humane to oh. do that. And, you know, I tried to describe their temperature activated. Right. So they're hibernating right, right now. Right. And you could put them out when the weather is right, right for right. it. Yeah. Yeah, they have fat reserves. You know, the refrigerator is like 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. It's just as if we were having three weeks of colder weather. Yeah. It's no big deal. Yeah, they're fine. The only thing to be cautious of is having the bees in the fridge. Uh, the refrigerators dry them out. Mm -hmm. So I don't like to have mine in the refrigerator very long. I always make sure I've got a damp paper towel in there. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about the humidity bee? It's a, it's a Mason Bee humidifier product that's on the market. I've seen that. I just use my damp paper towel. Yeah. That's what I do. I use, you know, when you buy the raspberries at the grocery store and they yes. come in a little plastic yes. clamshell yes. and yes. there's a little pad underneath them um, oh. to absorb yeah. moisture. Right. And I'll, I'll fill that. I'll keep that moist and then the little cocoons go on top of that. Right. It's like a DIY humidity. Yes. <laughs> so that works. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. I don't worry about the humidity too much, mm -hmm. uh, but I do keep that, that damp paper towel in there just so I can take care of my bees. Yeah. So the first year I um, started doing mason bees, I probably started out with 100. That's a lot. Um, last year I had 1,500. <gasps> this year I have 3,000. Oh, my gosh. I don't know what I'm going to have next year. Wow. But I sell out every year. I what do you do for, out. for harvesting? Because that's, that's a lot to harvest and clean. Um, do you have people help you? I don't have people help me. And um, I'm kind of a detail-oriented person, um, uh, honest to God. My 300 dahlias are, <laughs> I, I'm embarrassed <laughs> to say this, they are in alphabetical order in my yard. Oh my gosh! They are in row. <laughs> they are in rows in alphabetical order, and I have an open garden every year. And when I have them, either the master gardeners over or the dahlia society, they're like, "Oh my god, Debbie, your dahlias are in alphabetical order." Um, <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I have. I have to dig up the dahlias every year. I have yeah. to divide them every year. I have to mark every single one every year, and so I am handling thousands of things. The mason bees are no different. You know, I clean them, I dry them, I count them. It's really not that bad. I think I could probably clean my 3,000 mason bees in two evenings. That's amazing. The most time-consuming <laughs> part is just tearing open the liner. Yeah. Once you tear open the liner, all you have is just a pile of bees. Yeah. And you just take a colander and swish them in, in the water, the bleach water solution, and rinse it, and then dry them out. So I was a little bit lazy with my cocoon harvesting yeah. this year, and I brought all of my mason bee tubes with me to an event. It was a science camp for adults, and I was doing a segment on bees and beekeeping, and I brought my mason bee tubes, and I had all the camp attendees tear open the tubes for me and <laughs> harvest my cocoons. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> they they really loved it though. I'm sure they, they do did. Some hands they did all your work. work, and then I mm. could just sort of walk around and look at the stuff they were finding. Oh, that's funny! <laughs> it really saved me a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so well you know, mason bees were my very first bee 
They were the gateway bee to all the other bees that I admire now. So that got you started. They got me started, and I fell in love with them so much. I just, I wanted more More. bees, and I did plant a pollinator garden. So I I do have, like, a small garden. Yay. Um, And I love all the different bees that come and visit. Even even just a herb garden, Mm -hmm. like oregano and mint and even chives. I mean, those things all have flowers. And they all attract pollinators. So it's not like you have to have flowers. You know, it's anything. Any kind of herb or, yeah, that'll work. I love the bees. <laughs> we got to help them. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, the Oregon's Native Bee Project. Um, I just signed up as a volunteer for the Oregon Bee Atlas Good for you. project. Good for you. And we're going out on our very first uh, practice mission um, next weekend out to Salvi Island. So we'll get our equipment and we'll learn how to capture bees. And then the first official sampling is the following weekend. Are you going to be using those nets and going around and swatting? Th- okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen that. I think OPB did a special. On yes. And I saw that whole segment and I thought, I want to do that. I want to do that. And in fact, they featured a guy who I knew who was like uh, organizing some of the master gardeners. And I thought, gosh, how did he get involved in that? I want to do that. I tell you what, the class for the just the orientation. Yeah. Filled up so fast. Oh. I mean, it, and they they held several of them, and they all filled up really quickly. Wow! See, that's encouraging. Uh, yeah, that's really encouraging that people yeah. are wanting to do this. And at the workshop, I was only one of two beekeepers there. A lot of the people were working with the soil and water district or the forestry department. Right, they were retired, or right. they were you know working on some horticulture program. So it was a really great variety of people that were interested. Right. And that really does give me hope. Right, it does. People, native bees are something that everybody can get involved in. Right. If you want to learn more about Mason bees and Debbie's work, visit my blog at waggleworkspdx.com. I'll include information on the Oregon Bee Project and the Oregon Bee Atlas. This podcast is made possible by the wonderful beekeepers and bee enthusiasts that inspire me to contact them and say, will you please talk into my microphone? It's also possible because of the listeners who have become patrons. Their support helps me pay for things like batteries for my recorder, the website that broadcasts the show, and the camera that I purchased recently to film bee videos to publish to my YouTube channel. Thank you for all of your support. And if you aren't a patron, but you listen to the show and are laughing and learning and enjoying the stories that we share, you should consider becoming a patron. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help me to create and share these stories with the world. Visit patreon.com forward slash Mandy Shaw to learn more. In the next couple of weeks, I'll continue to monitor the growth of my colonies and watch my splits for signs of queen rearing. The new queens from the splits that I made over this last weekend will be mating around Easter and should be laying eggs towards the end of the first week of May. Fingers crossed there will be enough drones for them to mate well. Happy beekeeping, and until next time, may the buzz be with you. Beekeeper Confidential is a Waggle Works production and is written and produced by Mandy Shaw.